Chan Li sometimes talks about not being aware of the breath and the whole body. Instead, just starting out by focusing on one spot and staying right there. Some people, he said, find it too distracting to deal with the breath sensations in the different parts of the body. As you're thinking about your hand or your arm or your leg, other thoughts sneak in and then carry you away off someplace else. He compares it to starting an orchard. If you plant your whole orchard all at once, using all your resources, you sometimes find that you've overextended yourself. You're faced with a drought for several days, the trees all die, and then you have nothing. In cases like that, it's smarter, he says, to start out with just one little area and focus on planting that, caring for that. Say you plant a mango tree, you care for it for a couple of years, and then you've got all the seeds that come from the mangoes, and you can take those and you can plant those, and then you gradually enlarge the orchard until you filled your whole plot of land. So if you find that starting out by focusing on the breath here and there gets you distracted, just focus down on one spot and stay right there. So you're not going anywhere else. You may want to use the word butto to help keep things under control. But just choose one spot in the body. It might be right between your eyes, in the middle of the forehead. Wherever you feel is just closest to where you sense your center in the body. And kind of stare right down right there. The one warning is that you not tighten up around that spot. Think of the area being open and free-flowing. In other words, energy can flow in, the blood can flow in, the blood can flow out. Energy flows in, energy flows out, but you're not moving. You're going to stay right here. No matter what happens, you're going to stay right in this one little spot. And I can gather the mind together, and that way you're not taking, too, taking care of too many things at once. Other people find that one spot is not enough. In that case, you might want to try two spots. There was an old teacher I knew who would come to meditation late in life. After she retired, she went and stayed at Watasukaram. And she found that the easiest way to get her mind down, she was telling me this as well before I ordained, was to focus on two spots. One was right kind of between the eyes, and the other was the base of the spine. Try to keep both spots going at once. You might, in her case, she said it was like connecting the two poles of a battery. As soon as the two poles were connected, th connected things lit up inside. And she was able to get the mind into concentration really quickly. And what this shows is that concentration is really an individual matter. Different people find that their minds settle down in different ways. And there's room in the practice of concentration for you to experiment and see what works for you. There's no one ideal topic that's going to suit everybody. And the whole purpose of the concentration is for the mind to settle down with something it likes, something it finds interesting. You know, the basis for success basically says that concentration will succeed by stressing one of four different qualities. Some people it's fired by desire or persistence or intent, which is when you just decide you're going to focus down and stay right there. Other people find that analysis works. 
and it was by analyzing the breath, by making it interesting and finding that it really is interesting, the way the breath energy flows in the body and how it can be very different from what you might expect. By playing with it, by experimenting with it, you find yourself absorbed in the present, not because you're forcing yourself to be there, but simply because you get interested. Just as you can get absorbed, say, in painting a, a picture. As a child, I used to find that drawing would have me absorbed. Hours could pass, and I'd be in one, working on one drawing. Simply because I found it absorbing, interesting. And the same can work in your meditation. Analyzing the breath, you pull yourself into the present moment, not with any force, but simply by the power of your own curiosity. Other people, though, find that analyzing things like this gets them distracted. And as I said, you start thinking about the breath, and then you start thinking about your arm and your hand and something related to your arm and your hand, and all of a sudden you find yourself 30 miles away. In which case, your meditation may succeed based either on the desire to stay here or the effort just to focus down on one spot or being intent on one spot or on two spots, whatever you find works. So there's room for experimentation, there's room for you to learn what works for you. So keep this in mind as you practice. You've got to use your ingenuity sometimes. As a John Fuang once noticed, all the elements in really well-balanced concentration are there in the seven steps in John Lee's instructions. Simply that we find different people find different elements to be the ones that really pull them in. And then once they've been pulled in by one of the elements, then they've got to balance out the other ones. Now he does talk about finding your one spot in the body and staying focused there. It comes further down in the steps. It's, also, it's often good not to think of those as steps that have to be done in sequential order. They're different component factors of concentration. So you may find that you have to start out with just the one spot. And then once that that's established, then you can move through the other elements. In other words, you stay focused in your one spot, and then you see how it's related to the area right around it, and then radiating out from there, the area is right around that, until you've got the whole body in your frame of awareness, even though you're still really staring down in the one spot. You can't help but be aware of the body. Otherwise, you don't want to totally blank out the rest of the body. Because after all, the purpose of concentration is to be aware all around as a basis for the discernment. It's going to arise when you're aware all around. If your concentration is the sort that blocks things out, it's not going to be a good basis for discernment. You won't see connections. And you have huge blind spots in your range of awareness where all kinds of things can hide. So that's one way to start. Go right for the one spot and then gradually expand from there. But if you find that too confining, the mind rebels against being forced into one spot, okay, then you can have it range around through the body. Notice how the breath feels in the toes, how it feels in the fingers, how it feels in the arms and the back, how your posture affects the breath, how your breath affects the posture. In other words, use it as an opportunity to explore. This is one of the good things about the breath as a focal point for meditation, is you can use it both as a, an object to stare at 
and as an object to analyze. Which if you find that the mind needs more tranquility before it's going to get anywhere, okay, you can just really settle down and be very, very still. It's almost like you're not even watching the breath. You're more focused on your awareness and the direction that your awareness is beamed. And just quite keep the beam steady. The one danger you have to watch out for there, of course, is that it's going to clamp down on the blood circulation in that spot. So watch out for that. Allow things to come in and go out, but you're at that one spot as consistently as possible. But as for the connections that you can use the breath as an object for discernment, they're, they're infinite. We were talking earlier this morning about name and form and how they play a role in the arising of suffering. Well, they also play a role in the path leading to the end of suffering. You've got form, which is the form of the body, the four great elements, and the breath is the most prominent one. You've got the perception. Whatever perception you have of way of any way of you have of conceiving the breath, that's an effective way of getting the mind to settle down. You use that perception. You pay attention, which is another element of form. You've got the intention to stay. And then you've got the feeling that arises and try to create a feeling of ease. In other words, instead of allowing these things just to happen willy-nilly, you try to bring as much awareness and clarity to how they function in bringing the mind to stillness. So these elements which, if left to their own devices based on ignorance, would lead to suffering, now you're playing with them in a way that you're very aware of how they interact. And this is one of the best ways of learning how they interact, is to play with them. So you, if you Adjust your attention or your intention, see what happens to the feeling. If you change your perception, this can have a huge effect on the mind as well. So what we're doing is we're taking the, the basic causes of suffering and we're bringing as much awareness to them as possible, specifically the, the awareness that's informed by the Four Noble Truths. What are you doing that's causing stress and what can you change to make the stress go away? You start on blatant levels of stress related to how you're sitting here and breathing, trying to get the mind to settle down. And then from there you're going to learn how to get sensitive to more and more subtle levels. So you're here right where all the action is. And it's simply a matter for each person to figure out exactly which place you can get your first handle on these issues. Establish that as your beachhead, and then from there your understanding will begin to spread out. So, there will come times in the meditation when you begin to think that just being very still right here is kind of stupid, nothing's going to happen. And you wonder, what, what else is there? What could you do next? Well, ask yourself, well, who says it's stupid? That's a perception right there. And right there you've got an issue that you've got, you can work through. So everything you need to know about for the purpose of putting it into suffering is right here. Just bring a lot of alertness to it, a lot of mindfulness to it. And notice what works for you in getting the mind to settle down. That's how insight arises, by seeing what works. That's the way the Buddha tested all of his insights. Did they work? In other words, he was looking for a pragmatic truth, the knowledge of which would make a difference. As for truths that wouldn't make a difference, he just put them aside. 
He was very single-minded in his in his quest. Whatever was necessary for putting an end to suffering, he focused on that. Whatever wasn't necessary, he would he might know it, as I said. In his awakening, he learned the equivalent of the leaves of the forest. What he brings out to teach in terms of focusing on the issue of suffering and its cause and its end. So that's just like a handful of leaves. But still, it's the handful you need. If you were to make a comparison with medicine, there can be lots of medicine in the forest. But just this one handful is what you need for your specific disease. As for the other leaves, if they're not helpful for your disease, why bother with them right now? The mind has this disease of ignorance, craving, greed, anger, and delusion. And if we don't take care of it, it's going to cause a lot of suffering for a long time to come. As for the other leaves in the forest, you can pay attention to them after you've got this specific disease cured. So everything you need to know is right here, simply a matter of paying attention. See what perceptions work, which perceptions don't work, which ways of paying attention work and which ones don't, which intentions work and which don't. Just by exploring these issues, you can learn an awful lot about the mind and make a big change in the mind at the same time.